It's June 17, 1896, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. For the nearly two years they had spent on the remote Arctic island of Franz Josef Land, British polar explorer Frederick Jackson and his eight companions hadn't set eyes on anyone except the crew of their supply ship, which explains the hue and cry which arose on this day when they spotted an unfamiliar man coming towards them across the ice. As the leader of the expedition, Jackson rushed off from his desk and he saw, in his words, a tall man wearing a soft felt hat, loosely made, voluminous clothes and long shaggy hair and beard, all reeking with black grease. And that person was the Norwegian explorer Friedhof Nansen. And there's a photo of it which you can find if you Google the meeting of Jackson and Nansen. And it's utterly hilarious because in the foreground you have these two men both on their skis and their Arctic gear against this incredibly bleak backdrop. And then in the background, there's this just very bored looking dog. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the story I really want to tell. Who was that dog and why was it so bored? <laughs> I think he was probably exhausted. I mean, actually, that was one of the reasons yeah, was, that Nansen actually. hadn't himself reached the summit of the North Pole, which was his intention, was because he hadn't been able to procure some dogs in Oliusk, which was the plan. So Nansen had designed this boat, the world's strongest wooden ship called the Fram, which was designed to withstand the crushing pressures of the pack ice in the Arctic Ocean for several years. I mean, it's one thing saying, oh, a Mm. a ship that can withstand ice. But he had foreseen, I mean, it's complicated engineering, but basically, if you designed a ship that popped up over the ice rather than being slowly compressed by it, then you could get further, which seems obvious, but he was the first to do it, and it took years. Yeah, Nansen's plan was really, really ingenious. And if it had come off, would have been a phenomenal success story. So he'd noticed that there had been this boat that had got into a shipwreck off the coast of Siberia, but pieces from it had washed up in the southeast of Greenland. He realised there's this east to west current going across the Arctic Sea. So he was like, if I can build a ship that can withstand being packed in ice, I can just ride that drift and then kind of hop out at the most convenient part, quickly trek up to the North Pole and then trek back down again. In practice, it turned out this was extremely difficult to actually do. The shifting mass of Arctic sea ice is extremely unpredictable. And at times they were actually going further away. Then they drift back a bit closer. So after 18 months, he and one companion, a guy called Hjalmar Johansson, set out with dog sleds and kayaks, thinking that they would just go there on foot. But the terrain was really uneven. It was really unpredictable. So although they did actually manage to get further north than anyone else had, they then realised that they were going to run out of supplies. So they turned south and headed for Franz Josef Land. And the conditions were much easier then, and they started making excellent time until they realised that both of their watches, vital for calculating longitude and therefore plotting your right direction had stopped. Yeah, I mean, before they'd even set off on this um, this bit of the expedition, which they did apparently because they got bored. Most accounts say that part of the thing that they were fighting when they were on this ship that was drifting through the ice was just the great boredom involved in sitting around waiting to get close enough to the North Pole to mount your sort of attack what on What about it. the crew, by the way? Sort of like, oh, yeah, exactly. I've got a bit bored, so I'm going marching off to the North Pole. See ya. I mean, you know, <laughs> crews, entire crews had died in these places through starvation <laughs> and freezing temperatures. He left them all on the yeah. ship. And there's a photo of them. All, they're all wearing suits and hats as well, which doesn't seem like the most practical North Pole wear. Yeah, well, once he was on foot, he wasn't entirely sure he was going to make it. And he was keeping a diary as he was going. And, and one of the entries read, my fingers are all destroyed. My mittens are frozen stiff. It's becoming worse and worse. God knows what will happen to us. And really, you know, everything that could happen to them in that terrain and with those threats really did. I mean, they, they faced uh, attacks by walruses and polar bears. They ended up having to eat their own dogs and feed their dogs to their other dogs. The most horrifying part was right at the end, though. So what they were trying to do is, if you imagine Franz Josef Land as this chain of islands that's sort of going in a diagonal line from near the North Pole, going sort of south, and if you reach the bottom of it, it's not that far to go to Svalbard, which is this island north of Norway, part of Norway, and that's where they would sort of be in relative safety. So they arrived on the northernmost tip of Franz Josef Thinking, Land. Thinking, by the way, that it was connected directly to the North Pole, right? They didn't realise it was an archipelago because they had speculative maps from cartographers who had never actually been there before. Yeah, and that was part of Frederick Jackson's mission was to find out whether there was a land link, which obviously it turned out there wasn't. So Nansen and Johansson finally arrived at the northernmost tip of Franz Josef Land in August, and they had to make the agonising decision that the best thing to do would be to wait for the following spring Ooh. so that they would yeah. have the best conditions and the biggest chance of survival. So they just reached this chain of islands 
that they could just hop down and be home relatively soon. But because of the weather, they had to spend eight months living in a hole in the ground with a walrus skin for a roof. Well, it must be said the the hole that they were staying in was relatively luxurious, given what they were working with. (laughs) (laughs) Probably not compared to Jackson's camp, which was called Elmwood, in tribute to Alfred Harmsworth's house in Kent, because he was funded by the newspaper proprietor, Alfred Harmsworth, who we discussed in our episode about the Daily Mail. The fact that he got up from his desk sort of tells you something (laughs) about his conditions. (laughs) But anyway, they did actually have a chimney that was improvised using snow and walrus bones. You sound like those people who are annoyed that prisoners have PlayStations. (laughs) (laughs) And they they spend their time reading sailing almanacs by the light of their blubber lamp. And this I found this detail fascinating. On New Year's Eve, so at this point they've been together for like over two years and they've been living in this hole in the ground for six months, Johansson noted that Nansen had finally adopted the familiar form of address. Until then, they had been calling each other Mr. Johansson and Professor Nansen. Oh, I love that. <laughs> just, I mean, I guess on their deathbeds, it would just be a bit much, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> just like, let's allow ourselves to relax at this moment. But even so, the meeting between these two groups was by sort of a freak accident, actually. On the 17th of June, they had to stop and repair their kayaks, which had been attacked by, yep, you guessed it, walruses. So they're repairing their kayaks, and then suddenly Nansen hears what he thinks is the sound of dogs barking and of human voices, which I must say, I, I, if I heard that, I think I'd just think it was some sort of... You Snow know, the, mirage? Yeah, but seriously, yeah, like, I think it might be a hallucination. You've been eating dogs and walrus. But as it turned out, it was obviously Jackson, and the two had this incredibly <laughs> polite encounter. One of them said, you're Nansen. Aren't you? And he said, "Yes, I'm Nansen." <laughs> Which I mean, maybe they're operating across a language divide as well. So no, but they'd met each other before. So Jackson says in his diary, before he said, "Aren't you Nansen?" He was like, "Who is this guy?" Oh, he didn't say that in his diary because mm. you know, obviously he's a, he's a Victorian. He said. <laughs> His hair was very long and dirty. His complexion appeared to be fair, but dirt prevented me from being sure on this point. And his beard was straggly and dirty also. We shook hands heartily and I expressed the greatest pleasure at seeing him. I inquired if he had a ship. No, he replied, my ship is not here. Rather sadly, I thought. (laughs) Buck up. (laughs) How embarrassing, he's lost his ship. (laughs) It then struck me that his features in spite of the black grease and long hair and beard, resembled Nansen, whom I had met once in London before he started in 1893. And I exclaimed, aren't you Nansen? So there you go. So that's why. So it was, it was well, from a position of that's surprise. That's quite a lot of inner monologue to be going through. There must have been a good 10 minutes of just and no one speaking. By saying that he had met Nansen once, Jackson is maybe downplaying a little bit of the status that Nansen had in his life because Jackson had actually applied to go on this mission with Nansen, to go on the expedition, to go to the North Pole. But he had turned it down because he only wanted Norwegians. It was being seen as this patriotic Norwegian venture. So he had said no. So he was actually a bit of a hero because Nansen was this massive looming figure in the polar exploring world he was actually an amazing person just to give the briefest of rundowns in 1888 he'd become famous for trekking across greenland on wooden skis he was the first person to do so which made him a national celebrity he was a trained zoologist an oceanographer 12-time national cross-country ski champion world-class skater and would go on to enjoy a second act as a diplomat and humanitarian which culminated in him being awarded the nobel peace prize so nansen and johansen got really lucky because jackson's expedition were awaiting their resupply ship so when it arrived about six weeks later it was able to transport them home by this time they'd had baths and haircuts they looked a bit more presentable and so they landed at Vardo in Norway on the 13th of August everyone had pretty much assumed they were dead by the way so this was a big event in Norway and then a funny coincidence just a week later the Fram the ship that'd been packed in ice that had actually made it too it made landfall south of Hammerfest and so Nansen and Johansen were able to go up there and reunite with the ship and I imagine the crew weren't thrilled to see them it yeah. kind of seemed like they have some in the yeah, yeah yeah you abandoned us and thought we were dead but uh you know you got to get great you got a photo opportunity out of it brilliant um <laughs> but they must have felt kind of stupid too because like actually had they just stayed on the ship they'd have come back at the same time basically and also newspaper reports had begun speculating in their absence that they may have made it to the north pole and so there must have been a certain deal of embarrassed confession to to be like well we did other great scientific stuff but no sorry we didn't actually get to the north pole (laughs) got a photo of a bored dog (laughs) (laughs) next time and he did was it 400 paintings but i mean maybe he'd have done 1600 if he hadn't died at 10 
Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.